people are starting to care. Part, part of the reason of writing this book is to is for customers to understand their relationship in the economic pattern. As long as you've got a choice and we've got a chance. So I want to introduce you to our neighbor, Forrest Pritchard, um, author of the just released book right here, which is four days old, titled Gaining Ground. Um, Forrest was an English major at William and Mary. Um, that's a distinguished degree right up there with the field of philosophy in the lucre department. Right, right. Yep. exactly. Right. And, there was farming and, as well. And he did, uh, he did um, geology as well, oh. so geology and English. Well, Forrest put his English degree to good use and wrote this easy-to-read exploration of his foray into ecologically sustainable farming. And Forest Farm, Smith Meadows, is three and a half miles up that way from here in the northern tip of the Shenandoah Valley. I read Forrest's book last week, and I can recommend it to you all as a sometimes touching, always honest account of his career uh, so far. So I want to spend a few minutes um, with Forrest doing a Q&A session and then digging into the text a little bit. And then if you guys have some questions that you know come to mind, we'll, we'll do some more open Q&A. And hopefully this will last about 20 minutes or something Sounds like that. Good. So first question. So ever since I read about Blackie the Killer Pig mm. in chapter 23, there's the killer pig in 23, um, I've had a burning question. We raised eight pigs over the years, as you know, right. many of which you ended up taking to the slaughterhouse it's for true. us. Yeah. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Two of them were named Reddy and Blackie by uh. our <laughs> boys, Jack and Eli, and so when they were young. And so I remember you were going to grass feed Blackie and Reddy for a while. So the question is, was Blackie Blackie? I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't think uh, our Blackie was your Blackie. <laughs> it's the straightest answer I can give to that. <laughs> yeah, we have very sophisticated naming systems. You know? <laughs> it's like we got Whitey, we got Blackie, we got Reddy. Can you tell um, us the story of the fateful encounter with Blackie, please? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, um, it's just, and, and and the book has photos in it too. I mean, the book's been out for four days. So like, I don't expect anybody to have like you know, questions about like what happened on like chapter 16 or whatever. Um, but, you know, gratefully we did take some photos along the way and they got included in the book. So you get to see what, you know, something resembling a seven, seven to 800 pound pig looks like after we ultimately sniped him. But uh, yeah, basically we had a cantankerous kind of animal that, uh, you know, where most pigs are pretty easily herdable and um, are pretty, you know, copacetic with a uh, getting on the trailer, we had an animal that routinely just made up his mind like he wouldn't get on the trailer, wouldn't get on the trailer. And this went week after week, month after month. And when you're a, you know, a great time budgeter like myself, where I leave myself about 30 extra seconds to get to the butcher and make my appointment <laughs> each week, um, you know, when a pig doesn't get on the trailer, then you say, well, we'll get him next week. Well, next week turned into like, you know, like eight months later or something <laughs> like that. Um, and at this, uh, the, whole, the whole same time, Blackie was not only getting like bigger, he was getting wiser to it so when we'd come out he would hide and we had we had the pigs on like 15 acres in grass you know like like it is when you drive along the highway now long story short eventually made up my mind that blackie was going to get on the trailer because he literally looked like a horse standing next to ponies you know out out, in the, out amongst the other pigs and uh um well i don't want to spoil it too much but he tried to kill me <laughs> <laughs> pretty, in pretty dramatic fashion it's uh, it's well described in chapter twenty three. I think yeah. that's good. And, the, and you know, and, and and part of the takeaway is, it's like you know, I, I didn't ever mean to make an put an animal in a position to like want him to kill me per se, and that's a little bit of a, uh, a you know, synthesizing uh, moment at the end where I'm kind of like, you know, what the what in the dickens am I doing out here? <laughs> that's true. That's true. Uh, I never ate him. <laughs> I never ate him, and I mentioned I mentioned that at the end. I said I said it was particularly karmic. That That's if right. this pig couldn't eat me, then I wouldn't eat him either. Yeah. So I was kind of hoping that Blackie exactly. was Blackie. <laughs> right. <laughs> I ended up giving he, him away. He was a random Blackie. <laughs> so you learned to, pro to farm pretty much from scratch, from, from what I've heard. Yeah, I mean. Um, I'm sure there were many lessons, some delightful and some horrifying. Um, and the book covers a lot of ground, but it doesn't really talk too much about the technical aspects of farming. Sure. Um, maybe that's a good subject for a future book. But what's the most surprising lesson that you learned about farming in your early career? Um, that it's uh, impossible. It's nearly impossible to make money at it. It's really easy to like run yourself into debt and 
have uh, accumulation of bills that are completely demoralizing and mm. and uh, you know uh, really positive thoughts here, right? <laughs> you asked the question. Um, yeah, I mean, what but you can did I say? it anyway, right? Yeah, so. yeah. What can I say? Like, um, that was our reality. I mean, I, I don't have to, like, talk very long to anybody in Clark County or Jefferson County or pick your state or um, pick your part of the country that doesn't empathize with how difficult it is to pursue the farming dream as a dream and an avocation and an occupation and have all those things intersect and still be able to stay solvent at the end of the month. Right, right. Tremendously difficult. And your story in the book shows how to do it to some extent. Yeah, well, it shows like how blessed I was with time and, and a few like lucky breaks, mm -hmm. I'd say. So you started at a farmer's market in Berryville uh -huh. and you're back, I hear tell. It's true, yeah. So that's cool. And then you moved on up to Arlington and DuPont Circle and Tacoma Park. Mm -hmm. um, do you still have to truck stuff in to make a living? I, um, well, yeah, yeah, and I do that, and I do that personally. Tomorrow morning I will be driving our truck to DuPont Circle in Tacoma mm -hmm. uh, because I love what I do. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't, tr I, like, I wouldn't trade it. Like, I'm going to go on a book tour for, like, the next month or whatever, uh -huh. um, but that's just because I got a book that needs, the story needs to get out there. But as soon as that's over, I'm back to driving my truck and, uh, and doing what I love. So here's a question. You know, this, this local farming phenomenon um, is an interesting thing. And to some extent, you know, Washington's local. It's only 50 miles. Right. But is the radius, you think, shrinking with the growth of the local food phenomenon? Is that why you're back in Berryville? And what's the ideal kind of service radius of a farm like yours? That's a great question. Um, and that's, uh, I think that's going to vary whether you live in San Francisco or you live in Nebraska or you live in Vermont. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think there's going to be some farms that are going to have a willing audience in their backyard, and that's going to be financially sustainable to people. And at the same token, there's going to be people like in Oklahoma that are going to be saying, look at this guy, isn't he lucky? He's got Washington, D.C. Yeah. Um, well, I, rem I remember true. in the book you, you talk about, you know, these people who say, can't you just please ship us some of your stuff? And you say, well, why don't you find a farmer in your area exactly. to buy from? Um, and my question is, is that a... A normal thought that a lot of people are having or is this a thought that is pretty new that you're trying to spearhead Look, in terms of the I, local farming phenomenon I cannot uh, Joel Salatin can't be meat king of the world Wend <laughs> Wendell Berry can't be like you know whatever king of Kentucky uh -huh. okay we have to have uh, uh, scores and hundreds and legions of sustainable farmers out right. there that are inspired and their sustainability is an economic sustainability. Right. Okay. And so, so, so you'd think there would be kind of a radius around a farm, yeah, sort I mean, of. I think, but I guess it depends on what urban areas are nearby and all that. Yeah. And, you know, and par part of the reason of writing this book is, to, is for customers to understand their relationship in the economic pattern. Mm -hmm. Is to say, like, look, we can take our values, whatever we value... You know, if we value like landscapes and, and local food and, and, and supporting sustainable farming and vote with our dollars, we can shift our buying habits and make sure that these farms are in business year after year. And towards the end of the book, that's got very little to do with Smith Meadows or Clark County. Right. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a much bigger idea. Yeah, absolutely. And it's very clear, I think, in the book. Thank you. So this question is a bit of a challenge and you don't have to answer it. Um, some of the interesting emotional tension in your book comes in your relationship to your dad, Ed. And I knew Ed briefly because he was good friends with Amy's dad. Of course, yeah. Um, as yeah. I'm sure you know. So for me, there's this note of defensiveness and perceived need for acceptance in the book a little bit. And in some sense, I guess the book project seems to be providing some sense of closure of for course, you yeah. with your dad and your farming success and all how that, that stuff kind of sinking in. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, it, 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 you in some sense simulate your dad's reaction to your success in the book, I think. Okay. And that's just my read. So I'm sure you'd be very proud, um, just so you know. Right. And we are all very proud. So thanks for doing what you did. Um, but did you take up farming as an act of adolescent rebellion? Well, <laughs> I, you know, I, never, I, I, ne I never really considered that. I mean, I think that's a plausible, you know, extrapolation. Um, now that I've got some of this stuff in hindsight. Um, I think that might have been, a, that could have certainly been a component, mm -hmm. but I don't think it was like a driving, a driving factor. Right. You know, like every, 
kid wants to, um, at this, you know, every boy or every girl probably not only like wants to be like their parent, but they want to be like everything that they think their parent is not. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to like correct all that, what they perceive as their parents' mistakes and stuff. Right. Um, and I think at being a 20, 21 year old, coming back to the farm, um, that was definitely in the front of my mind, like, okay, well, my parents couldn't do this. So that per that's just like, you know, kind of like the, the gold, gold ring. You right. Know, like maybe I can, I can grab a hold By of God, this. By God, I got to do it. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I think a lot of what, what motivated me, like, like I said, that was a component. But mostly, the biggest thing that motivated me was driving down 340 uh, to Charlestown and back. Or driving up, uh, uh, or driving up down 7 uh, into D.C. and back. And seeing these farms just within a day getting bulldozed. Uh -huh. uh, and we Turned still into see houses. It. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that was uh, that was the major motivation. Yeah, that was yeah. that was like no stretch for me to say like if there's bulldozers there, like you see when you drive down the Dulles Toll Road tonight, if you care to take a field trip. Right. Um, it wasn't hard for me to say like, look, we're not getting our bills paid either. Mm -hmm. uh, we better do something. Right. Right. Well, the the story has that nice, you know, humanizing element of your relationship with your dad and your family and the whole notion of success and. All these things are all tied together in a nice package. So one last one, and this one's really easy. So what's the most surprising thing that you learned while you were writing this book over, you told me the other day, five years? Mm -hmm. That's the easiest question. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, well, I think, I th I, think it, I thank my editor for this. Like, I had no idea. Like, writing is such... Um, and, and, you know, everybody, everybody here has written something at, at one point, whether it's, you know, just some academic assignments or, or they've done more than that. And everybody knows that writing is like a, uh, it's a solo exercise. It's a, it's like a, it's something where you have to live in your head. And when you live in your head for five years, writing something, you start to hear voices that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, may or may not be like healthy. <laughs> Let me or, scoop my chair Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know, but I mean, my point, is, I say that jokingly, but my point is, is you begin to get, you begin to come have like circular conversations with yourself. Right. You know, you're like, okay, is this good? Or is this still funny? Like I've read this like 18 times. Is it still funny? Maybe it's not, I don't, maybe it's not funny anymore. So you like, you need somebody to check in. And my editor not only like was able to check in, she's like, look, there's like, you know, a, there's a shortcoming here in, in this relationship. And like you say nothing about this and right and i'm like oh of course like and I, somebody says that and you're like of course i didn't right um, now i can see it but when you're just by yourself so that outside see. perspective was the the most interesting phenomenon that's my long-winded answer to a short question no i like it that's a very good answer the um the question is uh was there a routine that you followed was there a set of goals that you set for yourself you know how did you go about setting that up fair enough yeah, like um, I'm a big fan of like uh, the there's a bunch of books written by successful authors that tell you like how to write. Like Wallace Stegner has a great one. Eudora Wealthy has a great one. Uh, Virginia Woolf I read right before I, uh, a room of one's own, right before I like really started delving into my edits. And um, like as much as I love all those things, and like Hemingway is like famous for like getting up at six and writing till noon, and then drinking white wine all afternoon or whatever. Um, <laughs> Not sure it was white wine, but certainly right. drinking. Drinking something. <laughs> whatever is handy, probably. Um, like, those things, like, it's, I'm, I'm really bad at maintaining any kind of, like, um, consistency with that. So I, I took opportunities whenever they came. Um, it's, like, it's very, um, a lot of afternoons, like, late afternoons, uh, all the way up till 1 o'clock in the morning, like, six, seven, eight-hour marathons and stuff like that. Um, and the reason it really it took me five years is I wasn't writing like the whole time. I knew I had the stories for the book, but as I kind of alluded to with Gary earlier, as the book moves on, it the story becomes replaced by the story of Smith Meadows towards kind of a broader national conversation about about food and, and farmers markets and sustainability. So like I had the stories, but I didn't really have it took me a couple more years of like standing at farmer's market and like talking to people and finding out like what was important to people, like what's on people's minds to say like, okay, like this is where the book. To synthesize that into some yeah. a, a arc. Yeah, and otherwise yeah. it was just going to be like kind of a collection of like. I think you did that well. Thank I you. I think you did that well. So the question is about local food and 
whether people are consciously purchasing local. Um, and I, I guess that's a phenomenon that would certainly look different from a farmer's market than, right. say, from Giant. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. If you interviewed people. Right. So I'd, I'd have to answer that two ways. Like, for me, it's like, absolutely. Uh, but I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm so biased, it's, it's preposterous. You know, I've, I've like immersed myself in this culture. So I do 99% of my business by sh driving my truck to farmer's markets and, you know, just kind of st wait, wading into that and letting it wash over me every weekend for years. So for me to say, like, yes, that's the way it is would be, like, foolish. Um, and to, to put some, like, statistics behind it, um, nine, three mar uh, market share of organics is only 3%. Nationwide, and does I'm that not, include the ones in the big stores? Yeah, that's yeah. that's uh, Whole Foods the whole on Shibet, down. Yeah. Okay, and that's and that's not to say like organic equals local either. Okay, because all these words and sustainability and all these things have different definitions. But if we're just going to kind of like throw out some generalizations and kind of like get some perspective on it, ninety-seven percent of what um, is you know anywhere around here is still being trucked you know fifteen hundred, two thousand miles before it gets to the store so so I guess to follow up with what Chris was asking yeah. do you think that the phenomenon is growing and how exactly. quickly is it growing so with knowing those two knowing those two things what it is growing is what it is doing is growing at, at a hyper hyper growth what they call like uh, from a business from a business standpoint it's in hyper growth which is l largely unsustainable usually it's like 30 percent growth 40 percent annual growth you know in the late 90s when I was selling at variable farmers markets organics was a fraction of one percent Okay, it was like you know 0.1%, 0.2% of all the food. And now we're at 3%. Well, that's a tremendous redoubling over what, like 13, 14 years since then. Um, you know, that's like 500, 600% growth, mm -hmm. uh, which in, in a down economy, I mean, all we hear about is like how bad the economy is. Okay, you know, we can't turn on the TV without it being a bad economy. And yet, during this whole period, like local food has just like exploded the demand. Well, um, that, that sort of bodes well for it if you think about current economic trends and the economy turning back on, sure. it seems like that'll provide accelerant for this local farming phenomenon. As long as we got the farmers. Yeah, as long as we got the farmers. Well, we got one close by. So well, we're going to make some more. Any, <laughs> you may, hmm, I'm not even going to take that one. Any, anybody else? Community or food is the question. I think to be like a little bit more general, it's people are, people are starting to care. People are like actually starting to like give a insert expletive about where their food comes from. They want to know that uh, the animals were raised humanely. They want to know that their food isn't loaded full of like, preservatives and food coloring and, and antibiotics. Uh, they want to know that by buying that food that they're contributing to a sustainable salary for a farmer. They want to know that they can drive out to the farm and visualize transparent growing methods. Uh, it's like a spectrum, it's a, it's, it's a spectrum of caring, I would say. And it's contagious. It's like the best positive peer pressure you can imagine. <laughs> so the question is, in light of the Monsanto decision in the Supreme Court, um, is there some chance that GMO can be on the downswing, I suppose, because of this yeah, local food phenomenon? I'm going to invent a, 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 my first sound bite ever, okay? Right, right on the spot. You're watching it happen. <laughs> as long as you've got a choice and we've got a chance. Okay, that's that's a good that's a good sound. <laughs> you heard it here first. Okay, okay, fair enough. And I take your I take that sarcastic cheer. Uh, a good, uh, no, 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 it's a real cheer. <laughs> no, I mean no, I, sarcasm wasn't the right word. Uh, good natured ribbing, so so to speak. But but it, that's that's the best way I can ar I can articulate it because if we have no cho if we have no choices, then we have no chance. Okay, and in order to have choices, we have to have farmers that. At the end of the year, they can like look at their bills and like I'm going to do this again. Like right. I'm going to come December, I'm going to wake up on January 1st. I'm still going to be a farmer, instead of like I'm going to be looking on Craigslist for a job, you know. So the question is, what's Forrest doing to help other farmers? Not enough, not fast enough. Whatever the answer is. <laughs> um, well, one of the things that you that I already alluded to um, in the book is you said people call you up and they say, please, can you ship us something to, you know, mm -hmm. East Jesus? And you say, well, why don't you find somebody local to buy from who's trying to do the same thing 
I am. And one suggestion was there were a whole bunch of people who said, well, we don't have any local farmers. What are we supposed to do? Right. And you said, well, why don't you go to a local guy and convince him to become a farmer? Exactly. Because there's some demand. And that was a really good idea. Well, and you made, you made reference to, you know, west of the Mississippi, um, this stuff isn't catching on. Um, well, have any of these farmers ever been asked by customers to, like, grow food for them? Probably not. I mean, not from the feedback that I get, like, from my blog, from, like, farmers in Kansas or Iowa. They're like, oh, you know, this is really beautiful that you're doing, but, you know, I don't know if this will play in Peoria, as they say. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. <laughs> right. So Augmented. the question is about food, food hubs and whether or not food hubs would hurt the business, like, for us, um, farmer's market business or be a good thing or augment it. Uh, un unequiv unequivocally, I say augment, okay, because a rising tide always lifts all boats. And this is, uh, this is about food. We're talking about, like, food. Okay, I'm not talking about, like, is Cisco going to sell it? Turns out you need it. Right. I'm not saying it's, like, is Cisco going to sell a router? Is, like, you know, like, you know, EMC going to sell a new storage device or something like that? And uh, this is something that all of us have hopefully um, done today is eat. Okay, um, and like let's just t let's just step back for a second and think like about like you say the food hub great great option okay it's just in your own personal experience how much more aware have you guys become of farmers markets in, in the last ten years how much more do you know does everybody know what a CSA stands for mm -hmm. could you have told me five years ago or ten years ago what a CSA stood for Confederate States of America exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Trick question. Sorry, I <laughs> forgot. I'm still in the South. You are in Virginia. I'm, only, I'm, two, I'm two miles from West Virginia, which is, which, which is, which is its own place. So. It's uh, independent. <laughs> yeah, CSA is a motorcycle. That's a BSA or something. Any, anybody else have a question? But I mean, JC wants to know whether we should restructure the the way that we do farm subsidies and the whole farm bill and all that jazz. Uh, yeah. In the same way, like I think it'd be like useful to like if we wanted to like stop the tide or like make the moon go <laughs> around the earth in a different direction or something like that. And it, go it goes back to like uh, being consci making conscientious choices. Look, like farmers are businessmen, okay? Um, far farming is a business just like anything, okay? What, far what most farmers feel though is they have no choices themselves on how to market them, their, their stuff. They feel like they have to grow corn and soybeans and wheat or grow cattle in the same way that dad did, in the same way granddad did, and the same way all their neighbors do, okay? And that's their only choice. A lot of people don't, a lot of farmers don't feel like they have any other options. Yeah, was that because a lot of them are getting subsidized to grow? Sure, I mean, there's, there's some self-fulfilling, like self-perpetuation mechanism built into it for sure, which goes to the, the farm bill and the lobbyists and the Iowa caucuses and, you know, follow, yeah. the, fat, follow the fat man, you're, you can see him walk down a lot of different roads. So the so the book explains that really well, and I would encourage you guys to grab a copy and read it. And everybody else who's listening to this on the net, grab a copy and read it. Um, so thank you very much My for pleasure. sharing with us. It was awesome. We're very proud of you. Just get warmed up. Yeah, we're super proud of you. For being here. Right, thanks, guys. Thanks, man. Yeah. People are starving in the mountains here Depression is upon us for a third straight year You can't make a living as an honest man So people try to make it any way they can